90% of our electrical energy is provided in the form of AC. And there are three good reasons for that. One, it's cheaper on the mega scale to produce it. Two, it's dead easy to transport along distances. And three, it's really easy to change the voltage up and down to a voltage that you might need. So we get most of our electrical energy in the AC format. Unfortunately, of course, different things need different formats. So if you've got an induction motor, you need AC. Some stuff doesn't care. Things like ovens, kettles, toasters, filament lamps, AC or DC is just fine. And some things really need DC, like your television, your computer, that sort of thing. So transforming AC to DC was a huge problem. And of course, there was a huge market for solving that problem because everybody has got an AC power supply in a huge part of the world. So the market's enormous. And that prompted a lot of work into how to go about doing this. Now, the first solutions were mechanical. And you're thinking about the uh, rotary converter, the vibrating reed converter. Later, we got other solutions to it, things like the mercury, la amp, the mercury lamp uh, rectifier. None of those were particularly stable and none of them particularly good. And it wasn't until about 1920 or so when a certain kind of behaviour was noticed in copper and copper oxide. And that was, it was very resistive one way and very non-resistive the other way. So if you hooked up a battery one way, you got nothing through. If you changed the battery around, it made no difference if that was there or not. And the copper oxide rectifier was born. Now the copper oxide rectifier is something you see a lot on the internet. People take a copper plate and they heat it up on a blowtorch or they heat it up on a cooker and knock off the black stuff, which is copper 2 oxide, and you're left with the red stuff, which is copper 1 oxide, and that's the stuff you want. Because copper oxide is a really interesting material. It doesn't only have rectification properties, it can also be used in a thermopile, as we've done in previous videos, and it can be used in photocells, which you see all over the place for homemade photocells, because it is a native P-type semiconductor. So you find it used a lot. Now, it was the first dry disc metallic rectifier. It was produced by Westinghouse. But of course the market was so huge, everybody else wasn't going to leave it at that state of affairs. And they came up with the selenium rectifier. Now to make a copper oxide rectifier properly, what you need to do is bung your copper plate in a furnace for an hour or so, and then cool it down with a specific sequence, and then anneal it, and you get an oxide layer that binds well onto the copper plate. In home versions, we don't do this, and that means it's a sensitive material. It knocks off really easy, it scratches really easy, it cracks and flakes off, so it's kind of difficult to use, actually. In the industrial one, the process to uh, stabilise it is difficult to replicate at home. And it's even worse with the selenium rectifier. The selenium rectifier is an aluminium or steel plate with a layer of bismuth over it, uh, or nickel. And then over the top of that is some selenium. What they do then is put a layer of tin and cadmium alloy on top of that and the cadmium reacts with the selenium to form cadmium selenide and then the interface between the selenium and the selenide forms an NP junction so it's a very early semiconductor. It came along a bit later in the day and it did have a dominant place in the marketplace but it wasn't able to handle as many amps as the copper oxide rectifier was so until the advent of semiconductors that was pretty much it. However, there is a little and lesser known third option. And that third option is the copper sulfur mag um, magnesium rectifier. This came along at the late stage of metal rectifiers when sil uh, silicon rectifiers were coming in. And it did really well, surprisingly, but didn't have a chance to get an awful lot of recognition. Now, Making one is really easy. It's not like your copper oxide version and certainly not like the selenium version. What I've got here is some sulfur. You can buy this stuff in the garden stores. It's really easy to get hold of. And all we actually have to do is take a piece of copper wire and heat it up to glowing red. Once that's glowing red like that, stick it in your sulphur, pull it out. And the sulphur will burn a blue colour and create this metallic sheen over the copper wire. Be warned, it's burning sulphur so it's a little stinky. I mean, a wire like that, nothing. But if you're going to do quite a few of them or a large plate, 
you'd probably want to be in a ventilated area or outside. Believe it or not, we have made our rectifier. All we have to do now is prove it's a rectifier. Okay, so as we can see this, I've got a power supply here that's giving me 12 volts AC, and I've connected up a strip of magnesium ribbon. It's just the magnesium ribbon you buy uh, for showing how brightly it burns. And here's my piece of wire that I've got the motor just jiggling on. backwards and forwards slightly because it's being supplied with an AC current, so it can't do anything else. Now, however, if I touch my sulfur and there we go. So the copper sulfide and magnesium is now forming a rectifier and that motor can spin. Now as we know these rectifiers can behave as thermopiles as we saw that in the copper copper oxide. So the question is will this actually do that job? So I've got me wire, I've got me a bit of magnesium with a light oxide coating on it and I've connected it up to a capacitor right there. So anything we can gather from that will go into the capacitor as a voltage and we can read the voltage across the capacitor, meaning that anything in there is now stored energy that we can use for later. So we're proving that it's storing energy. Anyway, what I want to do is turn this on, stick that in there, and then we can have a look at what it actually produces. Okay, to my mind, that was awesome. Now, I don't know if it works better than the copper oxide or not, to be honest. All I know is that it was super, super easy to make and it actually works. So, of course, the thing to do is to investigate that a little bit further. Now, we made the um, copper sulfide as, uh, so, as, as simple as possible. There are better ways to make that. And this does actually work really well if you take that copper sulfide and compress it into a disc. It's certainly how they used to make these uh, rectifiers when they were making these rectifiers. So we could make a nanostructured copper sulfide by mixing sodium sulfide with copper sulfate. The copper sulfide will drop out as nanoparticles. We can collect them, compress them and try that. And that would be the next stage. All we've done here is a proof of concept that this thing actually works, which is pretty cool. What we need to do now is refine that a little bit. Anyway, I thought I would share it with you to show you that this actually does work as a thermopile. I thought it was really interesting, so I thought I would share it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching.